Hello, everyone, and welcome to our A to J Author new user webinar. This is Jessica Frank, A to J Authors Project Manager. Today, we're going to talk about A to J guided interviews and our accessibility audit that we just completed for the A to J viewer. On our agenda today, we're going to go over authoring tips for the month of April, things that have come up over the past month when I've uh, been working with authors um, since our last training, things that I want to alert you to, and any news that we have to cover. And then we'll talk about the accessibility audit that we just completed, what we're doing to improve accessibility, and what you as authors can do to even further that accessibility for your end users. So first on the authoring tips, um, we have uh, been alerted to a bug that exit and save is not currently working in the mobile viewer, but we are on it and we are working to fix it. It's a high priority in our issue queue and will be dealt with um, as soon as possible. Analytics, uh, A to J analytics are coming soon to Law Help Interactive. For those of you that host your guided interviews through LHI, they will be enabling the A to J analytic containing viewer shortly. To learn more about it um, and what you have to do as an author to allow your interviews to be tracked through our analytics, um, to find out what we're tracking, what we're doing with it, where we're storing that data, and how authors can access it. Later, um, you just want to go to a to j author.org slash content slash a to j analytics. If you forget this URL or don't write it down, you can always go to the about tab on our website and we have the same section on a to j analytics. For those of you that are in the process of converting your a to j4 to a to j6 guided interviews, and I hope that is all of you. There is still free help available for converting those. So reach out to me. We have um, existing resources partnered with Chicago Kent, and we also have a TIG through Michigan Legal Services where we can help you with the planning for your conversions, some of the high level, um, how to staff up for it, what interviews should be uh, tackled first, what you need to do to, to do the conversion, and also the actual conversions themselves and some basic testing to ensure functionality is still the same. Um, and planning what to do uh, with your interviews after they're converted. So reach out to me. My email will be at the end of the slide deck, but it's just jessica at cali, C-A-L-I dot org. Um, the final tip for this month was uh, I get questions a lot about A to J, and there's some misinformation out there about what the capacity of a guided interview can be. So is there a limit to the number of questions within an interview? And the answer is no. There is no limit to the number of questions that you can have within a guided interview. Um, you can only have 12 steps. So all of those questions have to fit within the 12 step structure of an interview, but there are no bounds to the number of questions to a guided interview beyond the author's imagination and creativity. I've seen some online intake interviews and some uh, interviews used to fill out divorce filings that have hundreds of questions, um, like 500 questions within one guided interview. So there are no bounds to an interview. All right, enough on tips and the beginning stuff. Let's get to the meat of our uh, webinar today. And if at any time you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and I will try to unmute you um, or put them in the uh, question section and I'll keep an eye on that as we're going along. So A to J just completed um, an accessibility audit with an outside contractor um, over the past month or so. And uh, this accessibility audit looked at the WCAG 2.0 guidelines. So WCAG, W-C-A-G, is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. They're um, a stable reference, uh, referenceable technical standards that are used across the internet um, to ensure accessibility to internet-based resources. There are 12 guidelines that are looked at generally in an audit. Those guidelines follow four principles, so perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, and they base the, or they test the um, application, in our case, the A to J viewer, against three different success criteria. So A, a double A and triple A during uh, with triple A being the best during our audit um, and afterwards A to J is now shooting for uh, double A 
compliance with the WCAG standards, both 2.0 and 2.1, which is coming out in the summer, sometime around uh, June is what we've been told, so that um, when the new guidelines roll out, we're also hoping to be AA compliant with those as well. And so what I'm going to do now is walk through some of the guidelines and what we're doing uh, to meet the AA standard and what you can do as authors. Oh, uh, question. I was just sorry. dropping uh, the link into the WCAG um, website. Thanks, John. Sure. Okay. So um, the first guideline that uh, our auditors looked at is non-text content. So this is the idea that um, a graphic or a video, anything that's non-text, is presented to the user with a text alternative that serves the equivalent purpose. So if you have an image, you have a description of the image. Um, and so what we're doing, what we've already done, is added alt tags, alternative tags, to images in the code that are used in our user interface. So the courthouse, our logo, the avatars, to explain what these images are for screen readers. And we will also add in the ability for authors to add image descriptions themselves. So that you, if you upload an image, you can put a short description of what that image is. We're also removing the noise, as it's called, for ARIA readers. ARIA is Accessible Rich Internet Applications. These were all very brand new terms to me before we did the audit. Um, but it's like learning uh, another language here. So uh, we're removing, did you have something, John? I will as soon as you finish speaking. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, so the final thing that we're doing is removing the noise for ARIA readers, like, for example, the exit button um, at the top of the screen has a floppy disk icon, which to the visual uh, user of A to J makes sense. It's the save, exit, that kind of uh, terminology or uh, reference. Um, and But we are removing that from the code side because it's the floppy disk image isn't really relevant to what the button does. And then um, what you can do as authors is to come up with those short descriptions of any images that you have. So review your interviews once we implement the alt tag ability for authors, and then go back and add those short descriptions for your end users uh, who might be using screen readers. Go ahead, John. So, so, so this the the third one there on the list on the list to remove the noise for the uh, ARIA readers. That, that that was that was part of like a, a big. Um, a big, huh, I didn't know that. You know, I'd, I'd always thought of uh, doing ex uh, accessibility work as having to add a lot of stuff. You know, uh, more code, more descriptors, more organizational things. And, and uh, one of the results of the review was there are places where you can, like, take things away or you can rearrange them in a way um, because you have to think from the context of, uh, of, the, per of the, the person using a screen reader uh, usually a blind person or you know limited limited vision, and and when you, if you have a lot of if you have a lot of I don't know how to describe it if you have a lot of uh, complicated scaffolding, you know their screen reader has to sort of navigate that, and there's ways in which that complicated scaffolding can make their job of finding their way to the to the to the pertinent content on the website on the web page harder, um, and, and I'd never thought of it quite that way before. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't know how many examples we'll, we'll be able to show here, but there's, there's, but there's going to be a lot of like behind the scenes, you know, hidden behind the, the drywall sort of changes to the, to the code, to the CSS that, that will hopefully make, make this, um, you know, not just functional, but like actually, um, you know, efficient and usable for uh, uh, screen readers. Thanks. Another one of the guidelines that we ha were reviewed on was audio and video and determining whether it's alternative or supplemental. So the idea is that um, if you have pre-recorded audio or video, you provide an alternative for that that presents the same information um, and you label it as an alternative. So we'll talk about supplemental in a second. But what we're doing for the alternative side is um, the, the adding in the ability for authors to indicate if media, like audio or video, is alternative. And if it's alternative, a label will appear that indicates that it is alternative and not supplemental. What you have to do as authors is determine, once it's enabled, 
to distinguish whether your audio and video is an alternative. So the same content just in uh, presented in an audio or visual format versus text, um, or if it is supplemental enhancing or adding on to the provided text. So what that would look like is here's an example of a learn more and it would have the text a learn more as a way to give the end user more information if they want it. And it would indicate, like say here, that it is an audio alternative so that the um, end user doesn't have to click the media unless they want to, um, that they're not losing anything by not having clicked the audio. Also then for supplemental video or audio, what you can do as authors is create text alternatives for those. So the idea is that if you had audio that was supplemental to the text, so it didn't say exactly what was written, on the screen, you would create an audio text transcript that the end user could expand instead of having to click the audio themselves. So if they had um, hearing issues they, and they weren't able to listen to the, um, the audio itself and they needed to learn more or to know more about what that audio was saying, there would be text transcripts um, available for them as well if they needed it. Along the same lines, the WCAG AAA guidelines, so this is the best of the best idea, is that you should also provide sign language interpretation for all pre-recorded video content. Um, and what you can do as authors is when you are creating any video content, and videos are still pretty rare in A to J author, um, but those of you that make video content, to consider adding captions or sign language interpretations to that as well. Captioning is fairly easy. Um, if you upload it through YouTube, they have some captioning services and then you can edit those. Um, it's also a great way to use up some intern time um, to have them caption uh, the videos. So that's another thing to think of if you wanna hit that AAA guideline standards. Another issue is information and relationships. So the idea- Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Thanks. Sorry, about, I didn't get in there fast enough to stop you. <laughs> scared me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, go go back one screen. Actually, two screens. Yeah, the audio and video alternatives. Th this, I mean, I mean, this is interesting right now for way more than just the um, 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 uh, accessibility um, capabilities here, because we're we're looking at A to J as a. I mean, in some ways, A to J when it's run on a mobile device, acts a lot, little bit, no, it acts a lot like a chat bot. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't use a chat interface, and, um, and, and, there's, and there's things about chat bots that are different. Um, and, and, we've been, and we've done some like very simple um, uh, explorations of, well, what if you turned an A to J guided interview into a voice chat bot, sort of like, you know, uh, Alexa, you know, uh, help me get divorced. Um, you know, and, and whether the text that's already in a, a guided interview is sufficient to, to, to deal with an, a voice interactive interface. In other words, you don't see anything, you're only hearing it. And the short answer is no, there's, there's all sorts of navigational and context giving information, be it on a, on a desktop or on a, on a mobile, that disappear or, or that become almost unusable if you go pure, if you, if you just do a pure convert of, uh, of the text in an A to day guided interview to a, uh, to a voice chat sort of thing. Um, and, 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 that, and that's, what, that's what sort of, I mean, this all came up because uh, we've had almost from version three of, of A to J, the ability to, for you to record audio and upload it. Um, as an alternative to, in other words, you could you could have the thing read the read the the screen to you. Um, it was never entirely intended as a um, as a as a an accessibility um, feature, but it sort of acted that way. It was hard to do because you had to record you know individual MP3 files and upload them individually and attach them individually to every screen. Um, you know, and, and for any reasonably long uh, guided interview, you know, with 50 or 75 questions, that would be like 50 or 75 little recordings. And then if you made one small change somewhere, uh, you have to go back to the same voice or you suffer the problem of, of sort of cognitive dissonance when people hear different voices speaking different things. You know, it became a maintenance problem as well. Um, and so 
and so we're we're at this point where we're really questioning the value of having that feature, the ability to play a video, sorry, not play a video, but play the audio of the text of uh, that that's in the guided interview. And 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 maybe the solution and, and one we're looking at is is uh, automatically creating that that audio using um, services on Amazon. There's something called Amazon Poly. Um, I kid you not. It's like the like you know the the parrot, I guess, where you can feed it text and it will send you back an MP3. You can either run Poly real time or you can you can do it as a batch. And we were looking at it as a batch thing, as a sort of a background process service that we would provide at uh, at a to j author at the at the authoring point. Um, but if any of you have any any thoughts or feedback on that, I'd love to hear that about how best to design. Uh, audio uh, capabilities into uh, A to J author. Thanks. Okay, so the, uh, the next guideline is information and relationships. And the idea is that information structure and relationships conveyed through presentation can be programmatically determined or available in text. So what this is talking about is for the visual user, they can see that this bubble is one contained unit that the question is at the top and there are three fields that the end user has to fill in and they're all uh, relationship they're first middle last they're contained within the bubble it's very easy to see this visually um, it's not so easy with the screen reader this is some of the structure and architecture john was talking about so what we've done is added landmarks in the code to make navigation easier for assisted technologies and we're creating relationships between objects that um, may be difficult to understand with the assisted technology. We're building those relationships into the code so that it's clear that first, middle, last, there's an order to them. There's a structure that they're within the one question and then that the continue button is at the bottom. So we're working to build uh, that relationship into the back end so it's easier for end users. Use of color is another one. The guideline is that color is not to be used as the only visual means of conveying information, indicating an action, prompting a response, or distinguishing a visual element. Um, and so if you've worked in Ada J6, this is a screenshot from our uh, warning that pops up if an end user has not answered a question that is required. It's a uh, light pink color and it says, you must make a selection from the highlighted space before you can continue but there's no indication other than the color that this is separate from the text or different. And so the what we're doing is adding in the sort of universal warning symbol with the triangle with the exclamation mark to indicate that um, beyond just the color, for those people who have some color distinguishing different difficulties, um, there is the warning symbol. And we're also working to enhance the contrast of the uh, the warnings themselves to in to be uh, closer to a standard. There's um, there's a contrast standard um, that is supposed to be between objects, different objects. So not just the warnings here, but also like the guide avatar, um, and they're they're wearing a gray suit, and they're also standing against the gray road to the courthouse. Or if they're closer to the courthouse, their back is against the courthouse. And some of those gray color distinguishing uh, colors aren't um, contrasted enough between each between each color to really stand out for those that might have issues with color. So we're working on that. Um, please excuse this very grainy screenshot, but the going along with the use of color is focus as well. So our current uh, learn more pops up in the middle of the screen but it doesn't really distinguish itself from the background. And so the focus where an end user's eye go, goes can be difficult to determine. So instead we're going to gray out the background and so that the learn more is more a focus point for those um, who may have trouble distinguishing where to focus. So that's another enhancement we'll be using related to color. We'll also be making improvements to the mobile viewer to use input types on the back of the code like tell and numeric so that when someone is using the mobile viewer for answering a question like social security number, phone, or zip code, the software will know that, that it should pop up the numeric keyboard rather than just the standard keyboard that pops up 
um, when you type in a text field. So it just is one more ease for the end user. And so they don't have to click the little one, two, three at the bottom to pop up the numeric keyboard. It'll automatically pop up for them. Another important functionality for screen readers or for accessibility is the ability to tab throughout an entire web page without having to use a mouse or touch the screen. Um, and A to J viewer currently does not allow an end user to tab to the learn more. So they can't open a learn more solely based on tabbing and they can't select a radio button solely based on tabbing. So we will be adding that to ensure that all features within the A to J viewer can be used completely with tabbing alone. One of the, so part of this audit review was we found that things we were already doing were meeting the guidelines as well. So time limits was one of those. The idea for the guideline is that if there's a time limit, you should allow the user to turn it off or to extend it, or if they can't do turn off or extend, to give them at least 20 hours to complete an activity before they're timed out. The good news is Law Help Interactive already had um, this ability built in. And so for those of you that host your interviews on LHI, there's a two hour inactivity limit on LHI, but the end user can turn it off by staying active. So long as they're continuing to move around in the interview, they're not kicked out. They can extend it and a warning pops up if they're hitting uh, close to that two minute or two hour mark to warn them that they're about to be kicked off so they can extend it. And it goes, uh, I can't speak for them, but I would assume it goes infinitely, um, or at least to the 20 hours, um, if the user is continuing to be active at least every two hours within their interview. For those of you that are self-hosting, you should ensure that if you do implement a time limit on your server, that you should make sure that it complies with the above guidelines. See, and this is why these are guidelines. Um, there are, you know, we, we can imagine situations where you don't want the thing to be active for like 20 hours, like a library where we know a lot of SRLs, um, you know, access these things, or a court kiosk system. Now, now hopefully the court, you know, in the, in the court kiosk system, when they when they exit, it like, I don't know, does the clears the browser cache or does a reboot or a reset or something like that. Um, but it's not a, but, but, but but we can, you know, so we can imagine things where we should be more stringent on this timing thing. You know, if, if there's no activity for a half hour, like chances are or two hours, you know, there's a very high probability that the person is left. And you don't want to leave it, leave their session. And it's not so much even leaving their session in the in the browser uh, happening. It's also leaving that. It's hard to explain this, leaving that session sort of extant in on, on our server thinking that well if they if that browser comes back with that session ID then I can then I, I, I don't have to make them log in again or restart or something like that so 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 it's a it's a, it's a deep a somewhat arcane sort of thing um, but but the, but the but the original point holds you know these are the these are guidelines that you have to uh, choose you know where you fall on on how you implement depending on your needs and and, and that this this audit made us think a lot about those sort of things thanks another one of the guidelines was that the um, end user should have the ability to pause stop and hide media and we already have that included in our viewer this little gif is just showing how if there is a video included in a learn more the end user can stop it can pause it, can stop it, and can close it. Um, they can also expand it. If you look in the lower right-hand corner of the Learn More here, there's an expand window, which will make the, the video full screen. But it doesn't automatically pop up. The end user has to click the Learn More to actually trigger the video itself. So all of those already meet the guidelines. One of the um, other issues was the size of the target for pointer inputs. So clicks should be at least 44 by 44 CSS pixels. And right now the navigation at the top of an interview does not meet the standard. Um, it's slightly lower um, in terms of pixel size. And so this is one of the options we're working with our designers on is to um, if you look at the option, you'll see that it's a little bit different than our current one because it takes out a lot of the 
uh, padding, so uh, rounded edges for the around the previous and next button, space between next and my progress. And all of this would allow us to hit that 44 by 44 pixels without interrupting any of the math that works for the mobile responsive viewer. So there are calculations behind the scenes in the viewer that tell where the avatar goes, where the little bubble goes, um, where the courthouse goes based on the size of the screen. Um, and that's how we get our mobile viewer um, and our mobile responsive viewer. And so this option would allow us to uh, hit this guideline without vast interruption to our existing viewer. And this, the, the place where that comes into, into play is, I mean, obviously in mobile or in smartphones, um, but also in tablets where, um, I mean, in mobile, people are sort of used to the fact that their fingers are going to be bigger, much bigger than the targets. It's, it's, a, it's a problem, you might say, and they don't, and, they, and people uh, compensate for it. On tablets, though, the expectation is that, you know, make the buttons bigger so that, you know, because there's no mouse, but there's but there's still the expectation of that mouse-like behavior in in tablets. It's a, it's a small but really interesting and, and important distinction that, and, and a lot of these are are exactly like that. Another one along the lines that A to J already has a built-in mechanism for is the idea that um, you should identify specific definitions of words or phrases used in an unusual or restricted way, including idioms and jargon. Um, so what you as authors can do is make sure to use the built-in feature of a pop-up already to define any terms of art, abbreviations, legal jargon, archaic words, that legalese, all those uh, favorite lawyer words that we paid good money to learn um, in law school, but you should make sure to define those. This screenshot is an example of a pop-up that is defining what the abbreviation RLTO stands for. So it was defined earlier in the interview as to whether um, the end user would be an RLTO tenant and what that meant. But this is a reminder that when they get later on, what that stands for and where they can learn additional information for. So this is a great way to use a feature already within A to J that doesn't take a ton of effort, um, but should be used to define any of those terms of art. Even words as simple as plaintiff, defendant, um, judgment, those kind of words are not necessarily familiar to those of us uh, that aren't lawyers. And one time, a long time ago, there was, I, I've had conversation with people about creating a sort of a, a community-wide uh, legal, not, not a legal dictionary, we didn't want to go that far, but, but a community-wide collection of uh, a glossary, I guess, which would be pretty awesome, right? I mean, I'll bet uh, with a little bit of effort, we could come up with the, the, the 500 or so or the 1,000 words and come up with the, the language that, that, that we could then build into, into the authoring system so that you know, it automatically looks things up for the, the most commonly misunderstood legalese terms that are used in uh, guided interviews. Um, you know, that's something that, that's like on the back burner to look at and when, we, when we get a chance. Same idea with uh, defining archaic terms or legal jargon is to try and hit a reading level. Uh, an appropriate reading level. So the WCAG guidelines are a lower secondary education level. After removing proper names and titles, any supplemental content, it should hit that uh, secondary, lower secondary education level. So what you can do as authors to ensure that you are hitting this um, is to use the report tab that's built into A to J. A couple of months ago, we did a revamp of the report tab, and it's much easier to use, much easier to print, and to see the Flesh Kincaid grade level. Um, we mark your grade level uh, based per question, per learn more, any point of text, pop-ups are included and reviewed. So each uh, individual instance of text in an interview is graded um, with sentence length, words, average words per sentence, and then the grade level based on Flesh Kincaid. And we also give you a review of your entire interview. So this is an example um, excuse this coloring on my monitor, but um, word count here, word count and overall grade level. Um, there's better coloring if you're actually in an interview instead of the screenshot. But it shows you um, for the entire interview itself down here. It's a 
grading level. So that's really good. But then question by question uh, what the grade level is as well. So external links, uh, the guideline is that basically things that users use on a web page should act the same way from web page to web page. So the idea for external links or outlinks is that they'll open up in a new tab, that it doesn't replace the viewer or the, the tab that the user is in, but instead opens up another tab or window. So as authors, you need to ensure that your outlinks to websites are opening up in a new tab by relinking them. We covered this in one of the webinars I did based on known differences between A to J4 and A to J6. But these instructions about uh, A to J4 interviews and how to reattach your hyperlinks to ensure that they open in a new tab um, are on our website under that known differences under the learn tab. Or um, you can just open your interview, delete the hyperlink and reattach it. Um, this needed to happen because A to J saved the HTML without a target for a new tab or window uh, for that link. And so to get that new link or that link to open in a new window or a new tab, you need to reattach the hyperlinks and create that new HTML target tag. Um, so this is one of the known differences between A to J four and six and a pretty easy fix to ensure that it uh, meets the WCAG guidelines. Along uh, another issue that comes up with the audit was that labels or instructions are provided when content requires user input. So on the left is an example of a pretty standard question, enter your name, first, middle, last. But instead, you as authors um, can be a little bit more specific or even um, it might look a little duplicative to you, um, but include first name, middle name, last name. Um, as a way to be really specific about what you're asking for your users, because again, when they're in the screen reader, they don't have the structure or the visual context to put these three fields within the enter your name context. So some of our structuring um, and architecture will help when we build those relationships between the fields and the, the question in the code. But you can also be really specific in your use of labels or instructions for your end users. Along the same lines, if an input error is automatically detected and suggestions for corrections are known, then you should provide those suggestions to the user unless it jeopardizes the security or purpose of the content. So what we're doing is adding in default error messaging that's more specific to where the issue is, um, which I'll show you in a second. But what you can do now is come up with customized error messages that override the defaults that are as specific as possible for your end user. So here, and excuse the overlap a little bit here, but here they don't enter their first name or their last name. It just says you must type a response in the highlighted space before you can continue. That's not as specific or um, as clear as it could be. So instead, we're gonna add in messaging that says you must type a response for the, and we'll put the label in of what this field is. So you must type a response for first name in the highlighted space before you can continue. And remember, it'll have that error warning triangle with the exclamation part mark so that it's not color only. But um, you can always override these custom, you can always override the defaults that we put in in A to J with a custom message that's as specific as you'd like. This is another example down here in the lower right. There is a character limit on, uh, or there's a limit on what the min and max can be for this answer, like a number. Um, and it's between five and 15. And so we're indicating to the end user, you must type a number in the highlighted space before you can continue and giving them the range between five and 15. Same idea for dates. Currently dates say you just must type a response in if the end user um, doesn't put a date within the proper range. So we're gonna show them the range instead so that they know how to answer it properly. That's my last issue um, to show in our audit. So these are gonna be rolling out um, as we finish and complete them or make the enhancements to A to J necessary. It's not going to be a one batch, poof, we've made it to AA compliance, um, but we will continue to roll those out. So keep an eye on the listservs when I announce code pushes. We should have the beginning ones for this um, next Wednesday is our tentative code push date on um, at 9 a.m. Central Time. We do a code push during an hour long period. A to J may be unavailable. 
but keep an eye on the listservs and our Twitter account, A to J author, um, our handle, to see when we make that final announcement. Okay, I'm uh, not seeing any. Thank you all for sticking with me for this longer than usual uh, new user webinar, but our next one will be in May, um, and we thank you for attending. Have a good day. Thanks, folks.